Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today to learn about how to recognize and reduce stress uh, in the animals in your shelter. And to me, this is one of the most important things I talk about because stress is so prevalent in the shelter. Um, I wanna start, however, by thanking Assisi Animal Health for asking me to present this talk and also for creating the Calmer Canine. So this device is designed to help animals who are suffering from separation anxiety, but surely it will be helpful for all kinds of anxieties in pets. And for people like myself, the Calmer Canine is a wonderful new addition to our toolbox. And my personal hope is that animal shelters consider trying the Calmer Canine on some of the anxious pets in your care. So please do uh, contact Asazi Animal Health for more information about the Calmer Canine and a shelter program where you could give these a try. Okay, so now let's just jump right in. Now you guys know the shelter is a very stressful place for the animals. I don't think any of you would argue with me about that, right? So let's talk about all the different reasons why the shelter is so stressful for the animals. Number one, they've been abandoned. All right, they're in a novel environment. They're confined to a cage. They're isolated from social beings. Um, it's really super noisy there. They're not sleeping well. The sight, sounds, and smells of other animals can be stressful. They're confused. They're frustrated. They're being handled by strangers. Um, they don't have any control over their environment, meaning that no matter what they do behaviorally, they cannot get out of that cage. And they're scared. And so if you think about all of those things happening at once, you can imagine how incredibly stressful it is for the animals to enter your shelter. Now, I always like to have you guys put yourself in the animal's place, because if you can put yourself in the animal's place, then you can have more empathy for them. And so the best analogy we have, of course, is prison. Okay, so I want you to put yourself, you know, you're in your home, the cops knock at your door tomorrow morning, you're under arrest, put you in handcuffs, throw you in the cop car, take you to jail, throw you in a cell. Now all of your freedom has been taken away, all of your control. All right? I want you to sit and think for a second how you would feel in that situation. You would probably feel everything I just showed on that last slide. Okay, now the difference between you being in prison and an animal being in an animal shelter is that you know why you're there. You know why you're there, you know there's gonna be a trial, you know you might be found innocent and let go, you might be felt guilty and have to spend a certain amount of time in prison, you'll know how much time you'll have to spend in prison. But the difference is we cannot explain it to the animals. We can't tell them why they're there, right? We can't say, hey man, if you just hang on another couple days, you know, the perfect family's gonna come in, you're gonna be sleeping on somebody's couch soon. We can't tell them why we put them in prison. And so they just are under this stress without knowing anything about why they're there. And so we have to try to remember that um, when we put ourselves in their place, remember they don't know why they're there. So because of that, shelters really need to put a priority on programs that reduce stress and promote their physical and psychological well being. What is psychological well being? Well, that their psyche is well, that they emotionally feel okay because keeping the animals emotionally healthy is just as important as keeping them medically healthy because these two things are intertwined, all right? And so if you're emotionally unhealthy, that can lead to sickness. And if you're sick, that's gonna affect your emotions. We know that from ourselves, all right? And of course, it's the humane thing to do. We put these animals in our shelter. We know it's stressful. We wanna be as humane to them as we possibly can. That means recognizing the stress and doing everything we can to combat it. So let's start this conversation talking about cats in the shelter environment. So what are some stressful stimuli for shelter cats? Well, just about anything in a shelter can be stressful to a cat. The unfamiliar people, the other cats, the barking dogs, the strange smells, the loud noises, it's all stressful for a cat. All right, and so what's really important is for you to understand uh, how to recognize signs of stress in cats. And so cats can show a, a variety of different things that let you know that they're stressed. Some of them hide, right? some stop eating, some feign sleep or pretend to sleep. 
Um, some get very lethargic and socially withdrawn. Some become aggressive. And that aggressive behavior doesn't necessarily mean that there's a nasty cat. It's a defense mechanism. It's fight or flight when I'm trapped in a cage. Some get physically ill and have diarrhea. Some pant like a dog. Some will vocalize. Some just sit there hypervigilant, you know, which is like looking around constantly. Um, sometimes you see changes in their, in their bodies and, and things like their pupils will dilate or get really big. Piloerection means hair standing up. Uh, their tail will swish. We know their tails swish when they're feeling irritated. Um, they'll clinch muscle tension. They'll just clinch and not move. Some of them stop grooming and some of them excessively groom. Um, some of them disrupt their cage bedding and some of them try to escape. These are all signs of stress in cats in the shelter environment. Really important that you recognize all of them because every cat might show something different. Some might show only one of these, some might show multiple of these, okay? And so we see them all in the shelter. We see lethargy and depression in cats, we see disruption of the cage bedding. We know it's so irritating. You, you get it all nice and pretty and you go away for 10 minutes and come back and it looks like this. You know, this is stress. Um, you see hypervigilance, you know, again, and that's where they're just constantly vigilant, looking around, what's gonna happen to me? We see attempts to hide. We see a motionless body. We see vocalizations and attempts to escape. So we see all of the things that I just listed, we see them. But unfortunately, the most common sign of stress in a shelter cat is the lack of behavior, where they just lay in their cage still, right? Maybe they're feigning sleep, pretending to sleep. That means that we miss a lot of stressed cats. When we're doing our walkthrough every day to assess how everybody's doing, which I highly encourage you to do, you're gonna miss some of these cats because they're just basically shut down. And if you just glance into the cage and see him laying in a bed like this, you might say, oh, he looks comfortable, he's sleeping. When in fact, this cat is stiff, this cat is vigilant, and this cat is wide awake, okay? And so you really gotta look closer to make sure you're not missing the cats that are just completely shut down. Also look for cats that really don't move about their, their uh, enclosure. So let's talk about stress reduction for the shelter cats, right? So what's really important is that stress re reduction starts the moment they enter your facility. So remember, first impressions are everything for all of us, for animals as well as humans. And so from the moment they enter the facility, so let's talk about intake. Now, a separate intake area for cats away from dogs is ideal. Right, the sound of, of dogs, the smell of dogs, the sight of dogs, very, very stressful for cats. If you don't have separate intakes, make sure all the cats are inside a carrier. And if the carriers have you know, visibility that there's towels uh, to cover them. So you should have carriers and towels at the front desk to be able to, to help those kitties that come in. Now scheduled intakes are the best, I have to say, where you actually make appointments for intake. And a lot of shelters are going that route and that's going to be the better way to do this kind of stuff. Now, when you take that carrier away from that person, what's really important is to remember there is an animal inside, a sentient emotional being inside. And so you gotta remember it's not a suitcase. It is a, a carrier with a cat inside. So please, rather than carrying it by the handle and swinging it, carry it with your arms. Keep it as steady as you possibly can, something we often don't think about. And the first experience the cat has with a human should be a pleasant one, or at least not a scary one. So that caregiver who puts that cat in the cage should be gentle, talk calmly, offer petting and a treat if the cat's accepting of these things. All right, you don't just throw the cat in and go to the next thing. And never house cats in the same room as you house dogs. This is a big no-no. Okay, so this is an intake room at a shelter I, I visited at one point. Cats and dogs together, this is not okay. One study found that the biggest factor affecting the cat's stress level is the extent of exposure to dogs. All right, so we got to make sure that they don't see dogs, don't smell dogs best we can. Uh, certainly they're going to hear dogs no matter what, but, but we have to keep that exposure down. But the most important strategy is that every single incoming cat must, from the very first second, have the ability to hide. 
Okay, this is so important. It's important because hiding is the best coping strategy cats have to deal with stress. That is their coping strategy. And when they're not able to perform this species typical coping strategy, then it prolongs the stress response. So if this kitty spends 24 hours or 48 hours like this, and then you give him a box, it's gonna take a way longer for him to decompress, right? Where if he has a box from the get go, that's gonna be important. And a number of studies have shown that providing cats with a suitable place to hide significantly reduces their stress. So what's really important is give them an appropriate hiding place. Something like this is not enough. Does this cat still look stressed? Of course it does. And this is not okay. If the only place that the cat has to hide is its litter box, that's not okay. First of all, it's not adequate hiding spot. Secondly, where are they gonna pee? They're not gonna pee outside the box, they're just not gonna pee, which means they're holding their urine, which means that's adding more stress because of the physical discomfort. So everyone should have a hide box from the very first second. I don't care what kind of box it is, something from the grocery store, the liquor store, something recycled, it doesn't matter. Every single incoming cat gets a box. Now, if you don't have a box or the cage is too small to accommodate a box, then you can try this strategy, not as good, but better than nothing, putting pillows or towels in front of the cage so they have some hiding. Now, the lack of control is the most significant stressor for shelter cats. So all animals need to feel that they have some control over their environment, that by making a behavioral change, they can change something in their environment. Um, so since we can, you know, cats don't have a lot of control when they live in a cage, giving them the opportunity for choice will help give them that sense of control. So we wanna give them a choice to perch or to hide. All right, so the cat can do either. They feel better, they can perch. Cats love to perch up high, makes them feel better. Or if they're really stressed, they can hide. That choice alone is gonna help them feel in more control. A choice of rooms by putting the portholes in if you're still using these small stainless steel cages. So they have a choice of room. Their toilet area is separate from their sleeping and eating area, which is really important for cats. Um, and cats spend a large portion of their day resting and sleeping. So it's important to give them comfortable surfaces. And of course, we know cats like to crunch themselves in and feel snuggly. So we wanna make sure those comfortable sleeping um, devices or, or, or sleeping beds are very comfy and snuggy for the cats. Also really important, keep things familiar. The unfamiliarity is really stressful for cats. So when they have a different caregiver every day, that's stressful. Try to keep it the same. Everyone needs a day off, but keep it basically the same few people. Being moved from cage to cage, really super stressful. Keep them in the same cage. Maybe from the holding to the adoption floor would be their only change. And when all the things that are familiar to them are removed every day, that's really super stressful. So the recommendation of the shelter medicine folks for the last 15 years has been spot cleaning cages. We don't take away everything that smells familiar. We just spot clean, okay? And if you do have to clean the entire cage, you wanna make sure you leave something with the cat that has that scent, all right? So I always recommend a rubbing cloth at the front of the cage that's gonna stay with that cat. They'll rub on it, it'll just take on its scent just because it's fabric. All right, you wanna keep the schedules predictable. Cats don't like the unpredictable. So stick to the same routine as close as you can for feeding time, play time, petting time, enrichment time, and most importantly, the chaotic cleaning time. If you can predict a stressor, you can cope with it better. So if it's about the same time every day, they learn to cope with it. Playing calming music, soft soothing music has been shown to have a calming effect on animals. And of course, also playing music during the day is gonna prevent that startle effect when a noise occurs. And so we gotta have nice music playing um, during the day. Some noise reduction important. So one of my pet peeves is putting a, a boom box radio on top of a bank of metal cages because it vibrates the whole cages and that adds to their stress. Put the radio on a shelf or on the floor. Keep the volume low, cats have way better hearing than we do, play only calming music and turn it off at night. They need silence to sleep. And we want staff to be quieter, no slamming those metal doors, That's, it's, it's horrible. Just imagine, not only is it loud and scary, but it vibrates that whole bank of cages. And try not to yell when you're in there. And you know, you're yelling to your coworker, it's, it's just not okay, keep things quiet. 
And calm social interaction, of course, can go a long way. And of course, I'm talking about the socialized cats, not the feral cats, but petting them and talking to them and giving them some interaction is really important for stress reduction. They also want out. All right, so if a cat has been in a cage for more than a week and it hasn't gotten out on the floor, it's important to make sure they've been there more than a week, they get out at least once a week to stretch and play and just move around. Imagine being caught in your bathroom for a week, let's say, okay, similar idea. Um, and then you can even try the calming pheromone. So the synthetic version of the facial pheromone that cats emit when they're calm and comfortable is in the product called Feel Away. And Feel Away comes in a diff couple different forms, comes in a plug-in diffuser that emits the pheromone on a constant basis in the room, all right? It also comes in a spray that you can walk around, you see a cat that looks stressed, spray it on a little cloth, wave it for a second, put it, the cloth in the cage. Never spray the stuff directly into the cage because there's an alcohol ba base to it and the alcohol has to dissipate. So here's our list for stress reduction for shelter cats. Provide them a hiding place from the very first second and anytime they need it throughout their stay. Give them a place to perch. Allow them a familiar scent at all times. Maintain predictable schedules. Provide a comfortable place for them to rest. Play soft, so soothing music at low volume, turning it off at night. Give them human companionship. Give them time outside of the cage and maybe even some pheromone therapy. Okay, now let's jump into dogs in the shelter environment. So the effects of captivity on shelter dogs, right? First, we see, like I said, with cats, we see lethargy and depression in dogs. We see boredom in dogs. We see profound fear. Um, and we see a lot of this, a lot of barrier frustration. Dogs are social animals and social animals are compelled to greet other social beings. And when they're physically prevented from doing that because of the cage, um, they become frustrated. And that frustration leads to reactive barking and lunging at dogs and people that walk by their cage, right? And if you don't do anything about the barrier frustration, if you don't try to help that, reduce that, that barrier frustration can turn into barrier aggression. And the reason this happens is because chronic frustration leads to anger. Think about some of the times you've been trying to put something together, let's say, and the instructions are terrible and you can't figure out how to put it together and you get so mad because you're so frustrated. You want to throw the thing out the window. Same thing happens to animals. Chronic frustration builds and builds and builds and pretty soon I'm angry. So we got to get on top of barrier frustration before it turns into barrier aggression. We can see redirected aggression, even dogs that came in together, maybe even litter mates. When they're in a confined space with lots of arousal and lots of stress, they can redirect aggression on each other. So co-housing can sometimes be uh, dangerous. We can see the stereotypic behaviors, like stereotypic pa pacing, all right? So we see a lot of different kinds of stereotypic behavior in dogs in a shelter. So stereotypic bouncing off the walls. And you see the pattern to it. So a stereotypic behavior is a pattern behavior that seems to serve no function, right? And we see these stereotypes developed in shelters when these animals are very stressed. And they vary in how they manifest. And again, it's this repetitive motion. And so we can see all different kinds of stereotypic behaviors in shelter dogs. Now, the thing about stereotypic behavior is that not all dogs succumb to show st stereotypic behavior. There is a genetic component to it, but what's really important is we want to prevent this from triggering because we don't know which individuals are prone to it, and, but we do know that once it starts, we can't stop it. There's no stress reduction that'll stop it once it starts. And then we just got to get that dog out of the shelter any way that you can through foster and aggressive adoption programs, because if they do this long enough, it's going to stay with them forever. So really important to, to reduce stress as soon and as best as possible to prevent the ones that have this propensity from triggering to it. So let's talk about stress reduction for the shelter dogs. <clears throat> Again, as I said with the cats, it should start from the first minute the dog enters the shelter. Really important to provide them a comfortable environment. 
And so whether it's a caronda bed or a half crate or blankies and quilts and things like that, really important to give them a comfortable environment. I oftentimes go to shelters and I go back to the holding and it's just bare. And I go to the adoption floor and there's beds and toys and all this stuff I'm like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. When they first come into the shelter, they should have as an enriching as an environment as they do throughout their stay. The dogs that come in should be given comfortable places to rest, should be given toys, should be given enrichment. All right, house the scared dogs in the quietest area of the kennel, really important. You know, one of the things that breaks my heart the most is going into a shelter and seeing this little scared dog in between these two crazy rowdy dogs. Try to designate a quiet kennel or a quiet area so that you can put the shy, quiet or scared dogs in that area. Give them a hiding place if they need it. Now, dogs aren't cats, that's true. Hiding is not necessarily a strategy they use when they're scared. However, dogs are den animals. And so when they are scared, when they are unsure, going in a den can be really helpful for them. So if they're really scared, give them a crate, either tie that door open or take the door completely off. So it's just a little cave for them. And you gotta reduce the noise. <clears throat> the noise in the shelter is one of the biggest stressors in the kennels. We know that most kennels or shelters are made out of cinder block and metal, and it reverberates the sound of barking dogs. And the decibel level can go so high that it's not, un, not healthy for us or the dogs. And so it's really important to try to reduce the noise. We can do it environmentally by putting up sound baffling. There's all different kinds of, kinds of sound baffling. If you don't have any sound baffling in your shelter, really important to try to see if you can get some. Um, write a grant, try to get some money for it. Again, some hang off the ceiling, some are in the cage, some, you know, in, in the bottom left is a brand new shelter with acoustic wall boards built, you know, at the, in the new shelter. But if you don't have any money or in the meantime, while you're looking for some money, there's cheaper options. I've seen people, you know, shelters really be very ingenious, put hanging up these big quilts on the wall to soak up some of the sound. The, the bottom left is just big giant pieces of styrofoam glued all over the wall. The one on the right there is that, that foam that people put, you know, inside of a room when their son takes drum lessons, <laughs> right? You wanna put anything up that can baffle some of that sound. Visual barriers on individual cages is really nice. If you can identify the dog that starts the barking, that can, that can really calm it down because barking is a social facilitation behavior, meaning when one dog barks, they all start barking. If we can quiet down the initiator, that can be really helpful. So sometimes we can find the few dogs that get it started, you know, at least during walking time or feeding time or whatever, we can cover their cage during that time. Or maybe even we cover all the cages during the time when we're gonna one by one take them out for walks. So this is something I implemented years and years ago. The shelter on the, the left was the first time I did this. The one on the right is a recent one that tried it, right? Just hang up sh shower curtains. And when it's walking time, just close them all and just open each dog door uh, gate uh, individual because that way there's not that visual stimuli that gets the dogs all riled up and barking. We wanna play calming music. Again, as I said with the cats and the through a dog's ear and the through a cat's ear uh, CDs are really great for that. It's just classical piano music. The research on this music was done actually in a large shelter and they have a shelter program. So you can get on their website, tap on the shelter program, fill out the form and get a free copy of one of these uh, calming music CDs. But of course you can just play the radio, play calming music on the radio. Provide calm social interaction at the cage front. Remember that cage is really stressful for them. If people are just walking by all the time, ignoring them, that gets them uh, you know, all riled up from the frustration. Um, sometimes people just go up to them and the, dog, rah, 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 the dog's barking. You gotta give them calm interaction, calm them down so they don't get triggering to barking um, every time somebody comes up to their cage. Give them time outside of the cage, really important. Give them time to decompress in an in a office or a real life room, right? The bottom right is the one, my real life room when I was the behaviorist at the MSPCA. And it's just set up like a, a living room in a home. And the top one is one of the shelters I work with. So get, you know, just designating a small room you're not using, a storage room you can clear out um, for, and make it a nice real life room. So get them out of that, that arousing environment. <clears throat> for a while. And of course, social contact is so important. 
petting them, brushing them, just hanging out with them, just give them calm social contact. Oftentimes they have the cage and then they have their walk. Now their walk is super important, but so is just quiet time with a human outside of the cage. Um, actually, one study found that just being in the room with a person, even if the person is not paying attention to the dog, reduces their cortisol level. Cortisol being that stress hormone that goes up when animals are stressed. And so just hanging out there, you don't even have to be spending time, you know, talking to the, the animal or petting the dog, just hanging out in your office can really help that dog decompress. Massage. Now we all like a good massage, especially when there's, we're stressed. You don't have to be a massage therapist to massage a dog. Just that nice, gentle pressure, massaging them, releases all these endorphins, really helps calm them down. And of course, predictable schedules are important with dogs as they are with cats, right? We want to make sure things are predictable because when your environment is predictable, it's less stressful. Think about what we do in our lives. We get up, we do the same routine, you know, on work days, it's the same, on the weekends, a little different, but we have our routine. We like predictability, all animals do. And in a stressful environment like the shelter, when there's predictability, it really helps. So they're not wondering, when am I getting my walk? You know, um, when do I get my food? When do I get my enrichment? So really important to try to stick, you know, not to the minute, but certainly about the same time every day really helps them. And of course, exercise can counteract the adverse effects of stress, especially aerobic exercise. So while a, a walk is great, certainly they need their walks, um, running free in a play yard, really important because we got to give them that aerobic exercise that releases that pent up energy, releases that stress. And so, you know, when we're stressed and we go to the gym, we feel better afterwards. And so really important to do that for them. And then there's the pheromone therapy for the dogs, the same company that makes Feelway makes the Adaptal. The pheromone in the Adaptal is the pheromone that a nursing mother dog emits to calm her puppies. And it, it, same process, they synthesize this pheromone, put it in this product. There's clinical research that shows that it helps calm some animals, not all animals, nothing works on everything, but it certainly is, um, can be helpful and it's worth a try. And then, of course, you guys have heard of the Thunder Shirt. Now, the Thunder Shirt, the concept of the Thunder Shirt is when you put constant pressure on the sensory receptors, you calm the nervous system. And so the original work with the Thunder Shirt was for thunderstorms. But we know that like the calmer canine, it's probably going to help other things too. And it does. And now the thing I want to just tell you about the Thunder Shirt is it's best used in like just short periods, like 20 to 30 minutes at, at a time. If you put it on and leave it on all the time, the nervous system just desensitizes to it. Now the Thunder Shirt and the Adapt on the Feel Away can be expensive. I always tell you to ask for donations because your, your community um, wants to help you. So put it on your wish list for your community. All right, so our list for stress reduction procedures for shelter dogs, provide them with a comfortable environment from the very first minute play soft, so soothing music, again, turning it off at night, work to reduce the noise in, in the kennels. Again, we got all these physical things we can do with the sound baffling. But there's also lots of programs like the Click for Quiet, which typically is, is part of this talk, but I had to shrink it down to a half an hour. Um, and so really important that we try to reduce the barking. Give them time outside of that kennel, not just for their walk, but just time outside, just chilling out provide social contact, ensure as predictable a schedule as you possibly can, give them aerobic exercise, uh, and then consider the pheromone therapy and the thunder shirt for those ones that are really suffering in your shelter. And again, perhaps even the calmer canine. So stress reduction is important. It's the most important part of our behavior wellness program in our shelter. It really is where we start. Right, enrichment's important, but we got to start with stress reduction. Of course, they overlap, and stress reduction, um, you know, enrichment also reduces stress. But this is where we need to start, and of course, it is the humane thing to do. And what's most important is we want to be as humane as we can to the animals that we house in our shelter. So 
Thank you for listening today. I hope that you learned some of the things uh, that you can implement to improve the well being of the animals in your care. Um, once again, I'm going to thank uh, Assisi Animal Health for all the amazing work they do to improve the lives of the animals that we love, both our pets as well as the shelter animals. So thank you. And my email is here and my website is here. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions, although I think we are going to take a few right now.